Hello, everyone. Uh, we are pleased to welcome you today to our um, big workshop. So we start today um, our workshop season, season that will talk about protein localization at high resolution. And before localizing proteins, the first step is to be able to label them. So the first episode today is about immunolabeling in light microscopy and electron microscopy. So this season will follow two episodes, one at the beginning of the summer talking about super resolution in light microscopy, and one in fall uh, about correlative light and electron microscopy. So you can follow all the information about these uh, trainings, these workshops on our uh, Twitter. So today you will be uh, with uh, three of us, three engineers of the Bordeaux Imaging Center, which is a facility in imaging in light microscopy electron microscopy and plant imaging in Bordeaux. So my colleagues, Monica here, uh, our specialist in correlative microscopy, Melina, uh, our specialist in transmission electron microscopy, and myself, Magali, um, I'm um, taking a responsibility for super resolution imaging in light microscopy. So today, immunolabelings. So as you know, immunolabelings are methods that are used to specifically target, and the keyword is specifically here, a protein of interest in a tissue or cells. But it's not only uh, labeling, it's also localization of your protein of interest in the context of your cell of your tissue that will bring you uh, the main information. If you already try immunolabeling or use it, uh, you know that there are a lot of different methods depending on the sample you are um, looking at or the imaging technique you use uh, to look at your sample. And you may have seen that each lab has its own protocol, recipe, tips and tricks that sometimes are kept secrets. So today we will discuss the main steps of immunolabeling, the one that are common to electron and light microscopy. We will see also uh, specificities. Um, so we will see all the, the, um, the principle, the aim, and how we can play on those steps to improve uh, the labelings. I'm sorry to say that, but you will not leave this workshop with a universal protocol because we don't have one. And we will also show you some uh, applications of immunolabelings, what we do here uh, on the BIC. And you will see that everything will rely on the way you prepare your sample. So you will have to go back to the bench to prepare your sample. So first we will go through some definition, reminder on, uh, on uh, definition. So first the labeling of antigen in tissue is done thanks to primary antibodies and uh, to a detection system. The detection system can be directly coupled to primary antibody, but in general, it's more often conjugated to a secondary antibody that will itself recognize the primary antibody. And we have different type of detection systems depending on the technique we use. So here um, you will see the scheme we will use during this uh, presentation. So you have uh, the antigen here, the primary antibody, and here the case where the primary antibody is directly coupled to a fluorophore, for example, for, for fluorescence microscopy. In this case, the more often case, the uh, antigen recognized by the primary antibody, the secondary antibody coupled to uh, the detection system, the fluorophore. In transmitted light microscopy and in electron microscopy, we can also use uh, secondary antibodies that are coupled to enzyme that will degrade a substrate into a colored or a dense product. And finally, in electron microscopy, one of the uh, mainly used probe is a um, secondary antibody coupled to gold beads. So the key of these immunolabelings are the antibodies. So the antibodies, they are elements of the specific immune response secreted by B lymphocytes after exposure to a pathogen that presents antigens. Antibodies are immunoglobulins, Ig, composed of here two heavy chains that are also linked to a light chain. And here at the end of the uh, combination of light chain and heavy chain, you have um, the hypervariable zone, which is the paratop um, the epitope antigen recognition site. So here with this uh, antibody, you see that you have two paratops, so you have a divalent antibody. We have different classes, different isotypes of uh, immunoglobulins, and we mainly use uh, IgG in research um, because they are the ones that are the main present in the serum, so when uh, making antibodies, it's easier to get IgG. 
And also because they are monomeric compared to the IgM that are pentameric, so it's easier to use monomeric props. So we will go through the main properties of antibodies, the one you have to look at when you uh, uh, check an antibody for your experiment. So the first one and the main is the specificity. Um, it's rely on the, the goodness of the fit between the paratop of your antibody and the epitope of your antigen. It means the ability to discriminate in between similar or dissimilar epitopes to really target your, um, your protein of interest. We also talk about clonality. You may have heard about monoclonal or polyclonal antibodies. It's because antigen uh, can present several epitopes that can be sites for antibodies. A monoclonal antibody originates from one single cell lineage, so it recognizes only one epitope on the antigen. On the contrary, polyclonal antibodies, they are a collection of uh, Ig um, that react against different um, epitopes on the antigen. So you have different antibody in the serum that react each against a different epitope. Something also important is the compatibility of the antibody you choose with the application, because the um, primary antibodies, they recognize uh, epitopes that can be in a specific conformational state. For example, you have antibodies that works perfectly for Western blood because they target an epitope which is on the unfolded protein uh, shape. While in, um, in cell or in tissue, your antibody needs to target epitopes that are accessible. So, some antibodies are working in Western blood, but not in immunolabeling. So this is very important to check if the antibody has been characterized in immunolabeling or not. Okay, so now uh, some properties that define also the way we are going to name the antibodies. So the reactivity refers to the species of the, anti the antigen uh, detected by the antibody. So it depends on the sequence that was used for the immunization. So here you have the example of an antigen um, coming from mouse. If you have concert sequence in between species, you can have multi-species compatibility. So then you will have the primary antibody that will be defined as its host. It means the, um, the species used to make the antibody, anti, the reactivity, and the antigen. And then the secondary antibody specified by its host also, the anti-species, Okay, and the conjugate. It's important also to consider the size of antibodies. As you can see here, um, the, um, with the scale here of two nanometer, one antibody is between 15 to 20 nanometer in the different directions. So it's much bigger than a simple um, organic dye or even than fluorescent protein. And this is important to take into consideration in terms of accessibility to the epitopes inside the tissue and also in terms of uh, super resolution. If you think about um, primary secondary antibody, you will have a distance in between your target and your probe around 40 nanometer, which is higher than the resolution you expect. So we have more and more access to smaller probes like here, the FAB fragment, which is basically um, a digestion of the IgG by papain to collect only a monovalent part and the paratop here. Um, you can also have access to uh, camelid antibodies that are smaller than regular IgG. And even now, we use these um, single domain um, antibodies, also called nanobodies, that are coming from uh, only the hypervariable part of the camelid antibodies. So here, um, so just coming back on reactivities of antibodies, so reactivity refers to the species of the antigen itself. So here we have the mouse antigen, so the one that was used to make the antibody for immun immunization. Then the host is the, the species used to make the antibody. So in the case of the primary antibody, you will have here in this example, a rabbit anti-mouse antigen X. And for the secondary antibody, you will have a goat anti-rabbit. And in general, we also, um, we also name the conjugate. So for example, for light microscopy, goat anti-rabbit Alexa 647, as an example. OK, so I also come back on the size of antibodies. So here, um, you have the representation of an IgG compared to some other probes used in fluorescence. 
um, like uh, organic dyes, quantum dots, or fluorescent protein. And you see that the IgG are much bigger, uh, which can be an issue for super resolution um, and also for uh, accessibility to uh, very uh, crowded environments. So we use more and more uh, smaller antibodies like FABs uh, or camelid um, antibodies and even the nanobodies that are just the hyper variable part of the, of the camelid uh, antibodies. So now there are more and more commercially available nanobodies that are either primary antibodies directed against tags or secondary antibodies acting as secondary antibodies uh, coupled to uh, your probe, so first and dye or nanogold. Okay, so when we think about immunolabelings in light microscopy and electron microscopy, we basically identified three common steps, three big steps, the chemical fixation, the immunolabeling itself, and the observation. Uh, and then we will have some differences in between. So during the presentation, we will try to keep this color code. When it's something specific to light microscopy, it will be in blue. When it's something specific to electron microscopy, it will be in red. So in light microscopy, if you think about cell culture, your protocol can be really straightforward from the chemical fixation, labeling, observation. When you work in tissue, you can have a step where you will have an embedding, for example, in a paraffin, and then sectioning, and then immunolabeling. This is also the kind of, um, of um, procedure you will have in electron microscopy with a technique called post-embedding techniques. Uh, in electron microscopy, you will have also pre-embedding techniques and even other type of techniques that will be um, detailed later by uh, Melina. So let's start with the chemical fixa fixation. The fixation aim to uh, stop your cell process, to stop every degradation, every movement, while keeping uh, the 3D structure and the uh, organization of your cell compartments. So we mainly use uh, aldehydes for uh, fixation and the aim is to create bridges between protein, but also inside proteins. We have two types of aldehydes that we mainly used, paraformaldehyde and glutaraldehyde. And the difference is that the reticulation induced by the glutaraldehyde is stronger than the one induced by the paraformaldehyde. And then the trick is to play on the concentration and the way you are going to combine PFA and glutaraldehyde to get the right reticulation level. So these are just two examples, for example, uh, in cell culture, 4% um, PFA, 4% sucrose to keep the, the osmolarity. And sometimes we add a little bit of glutaraldehyde to uh, improve the, the fixation. Um, just a note, as we switch from living sample to fixed sample, we always work at 37 degrees to, to preserve the sample at the beginning of the fixation. So it's always a play between conservation of the 3D structure. So you, you, you would imagine that you would like the, the biggest reticulation possible, but doing that, you will reduce the antibody accessibility because you will create a very, um, very um, closed mesh. Um, so it's always a balance between accessibility of the antigen and a reticulation and preservation of the structure. You also have to keep in mind that once the fixation is done, you may have free aldehydes that are not uh, occupied. And aldehyde, they bind the uh, NH2 um, um, groups of, uh, of proteins. So any uh, simple amino acid will be bind by aldehydes. So the idea is to block them after the fixation. For PFA, we use um, ammonium chloride or glycine simply, but for glutaraldehyde, we use a reduction uh, with a sodium borohydrate that, that help to avoid non-specific binding to free remaining aldehydes uh, after all in the, after in the, in the immuno. So in the immunolabeling itself, we have four different steps. The first one will be the permeabilization that will allow to get access to the inside of the tissue and inside the cells also. Uh, the saturation blocking step to avoid non-specific labeling, the use of the antibody themselves to target the protein, and the washes, which are, for me, the most important step of your uh, immunolabeling that will allow you to uh, remove all the excess solution you have and the products you have in your, uh, in your sample. 
for permeabilization, at least in my experience, I uh, mainly now use only detergent, so non-denaturating detergent that will allow to create pores in the, in the membranes. The, um, the more famous being the triton here that we use at different concentration. Um, or the saponin that can be an alternative to be uh, more gentle, let's say, with the sample. But the saponin uh, gets washed, so it has to be kept in all the, the, the solution after the, the permeabilization step. The detergent allows a good conservation of the 3D structure, but it can uh, give only an average accessibility to uh, the antigens. So then the play is between concentration and incubation to preserve the structure, but getting in, um, an easy access inside uh, the sample. We can also use solvents for uh, permeabilization, like methanol or acetone. They will induce lipid solubilization, protein precipitation, uh, membrane disintegration, but they will give a very good accessibility for antibodies. But there is a total loss in the 3D structure. So it's uh, not suitable for the study, for example, of membrane protein because you will completely change your membranes. So the permeabilization is absolutely necessary for intracellular labeling in light microscopy. In, elect in electron microscopy, it will only be necessary when you do pre-embedding immunolabeling. The saturation or blocking step uh, aims to prevent non-specific binding of antibodies. <clears throat> and um, the principle is that we are going to fix uh, agents that have a low affinity interaction. So they, so they will coat um, all the parts of your sample. And then the idea is that it's only when you come with strong specific interaction like antibody antibody, uh, antigen th that um, you will be able to displace the saturation uh, agents and to replace it by your antibody. So the saturation agent has to be kept in all the, the buffer to maintain uh, a certain pressure on the sample. The first one we use is the BSA with different concentration uh, because it's easy and also because uh, during the immunization um, there is the use of albumin so you can have anti-albumin antibodies in the serum of your antibody so it's interesting to use BSA to block them. Um, you can also use the ser uh, some serum, so either serum from the sample species, uh, uh, which is called the non-immune serum, or se uh, serum from the secondary antibody species to avoid non-specific binding of the, of the secondary antibodies. Uh, we use also gelatin of fish skin. All this uh, has to be adapted depending on the specificity and the affinity of the antibody you use and depending on your sample. Some labeling will work with BSA, other will work with gelatin. It has to be uh, tested. So for the labeling, so as we saw before, um, we have the antigen, the first antibody, which is made here in this example in mouse, and the secondary antibody, which is made in the goat against the mouse. As soon as you want to do uh, multiple labeling, you will have to take care about the combination of antibodies. So in general, you don't have so much, so much choice in, in terms of primary antibody because they are not uh, as available as secondary antibodies, but you have to take care to have different species in between the uh, primary antibodies so that you can get secondary antibodies that are specifically targeting the different species. So you have to check to avoid cross-reaction. Um, so, for example, also you, you can also um, pay attention to avoid closed species. For example, if you have a primary mouse antibody and a primary rat antibody, there is a big chance that the secondary will cross and recognize rat and mouse. So, for that, you can use what's called cross-absorbed uh, antibodies, like indicated here. So, your rat antibody, for example, will be run on a colon of, um, of uh, mouse uh, FC uh, fragments to avoid um, antibodies that are recognize or recognizing also the mouse uh, FC fragment. So, for your antibodies, you have to control them. You have to control that they are working. You have to control that they are specific. So, we have two types of control, positive and negative control. Excuse me. <clears throat> Um, is it possible to have uh, the first antibody, for example, uh, a donkey, and uh, for another type of protein, uh, to have the secondary antibodies uh, hosted in the donkey? So you mean that your primary antibody is a donkey anti-something? Yes. 
and then you will have uh, a donkey anti uh, goat anti mouse exactly mm. uh, theoretically the problem is that you will have another secondary that will be an anti donkey mm -hmm. because you As have the donkey anti protein and then you mm -hmm. will have an anti donkey something yes. created So then if you have another secondary which is made in the donkey, you will have a cross reaction between your first secondary and your, you will have a triple labeling. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, mm -hmm. no. okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. So the first positive controls aim to uh, assess the specificity of the primary antibody. And so to do that, you can use other techniques like biochemistry, for example. But the best positive control is the use of knockout systems. If you don't have labeling in the knockout compared to the wild type, you are sure of the specificity of your antibody. If you don't have access to knockout system, you can use also overexpression system. If you have an increase of the labeling in your overexpressing cells compared to your wild type cells, it's also a sign that your system is working properly. And finally, you can also uh, do a range of concentration of primary antibodies. If your system is specific, you should have an increase. Um, when you increase the concentration, you should, should have an increase in the labeling. And this can also help to define the right concentration for your primary antibody. Another type of positive control is to control the experiment itself um, and to control that you still have access to the antigen, that the, anti that the antigenicity of the sample is preserved after all the treatments. So here the idea is to use another labeling, uh, co-labeling with something you know, an antibody that you already know that is working and the structure that is easy to identify. For example, you have something, an antibody working really well uh, in mitochondria, you can use that as a control that you can access intracellular compartments and that your immunolabeling in general is working. Negative controls um, are here to control the specificity of the detection system. So to control that the signal you have is specific and not due to non-specific binding uh, to the tissue or to other epitopes. So the first control is to replace the primary antibody by non-immune serum or the same azotype uh, immunoglobulin. If the secondary binds, it means that it's a non-specific reaction. You can also forget to put the primary antibody on your sample. If the secondary binds, you have a non-specific binding to the tissue. Um, and also you can use the antigenic peptide that was used to uh, make the antibody um, to make a competition with your primary antibody to see if you have a change in the, in the labeling. And finally, the washes uh, that are for me the main step of this uh, immunolabeling. So it's very important to guarantee the quality of your labeling. Uh, it allows to remove uh, the excess of uh, all the regions we use because we are always working in excess. And it allows to keep only the strong and specific interactions. In light microscopy, it's very important because it uh, preserves the sample hydration and it preserves the fluorescence. So it seems silly, but how to do the washes? Uh, you have to do them between every steps. Uh, in general, we use um, saline solutions containing the saturating agent as soon as we have um, um, do the saturation. And the idea is really to dilute the maximum the product. So we do them in big volume. Um, we do a lot of short washes instead of a few long washes. So something I like to do is like three fast washes. I leave the third washes for 10 minutes on the agitation, and then I redo three fast washes. Um, the agitation can help also. Of course, it has to be a soft agitation to protect uh, the sample. Okay, so now we arrive to uh, how we are going to look at our, um, our uh, sample. So we will have some differences in between light microscopy and electron microscopy. So we will have differences in the probes we use. Um, we can also use um, system to see the, the cellular context in light microscopy. And we will have to talk also about the mounting media. So I will present you this part and then Melina uh, will present the specificity of electron microscopy and also some uh, troubleshooting on, uh, on uh, immunolabelings. So in fluorescence microscopy, uh, we use fluorochrome or fluorophore that are natural or synthetic probes, uh, molecules able to emit fluorescence. So I will not talk about uh, fluorescence today because we don't have time for that, but we can discuss if you have questions after that. 
we have three families, um, organic molecules like the cyanins, the alexas, the atos, and all the molecules that are developed every day. So here is just an example of the wide range of uh, fluorescent alexas that exist, but uh, there are also other, other brands of uh, fluorescent marker. Fluorescent protein, we also have a very wide range of fluorescent protein, thanks to all the work done, uh, particularly by uh, the lab of uh, Roger Tien. Um, even if here we don't plan to use uh, fluorescent proteins for immunolabeling, it's important to keep in mind that we have now antibodies directed against uh, the GFPs and things like that, that can help also to amplify signal or to combine uh, fluorescent microscopy and uh, electron microscopy. And we can also use, uh, even if it's uh, in, in particular application, quantum dots that are uh, nano uh, crystal uh, that uh, are functionalized to be able to bind to uh, secondary antibodies or antibodies in general. And the particularity of quantum dots is that it's their size that define the emission uh, wavelength. So you have a range of wavelengths that you can use. What is important in fluorescence microscopy is how you are going to select your dye or your fluorophore. It's very important to know the spectra, and particularly when you want to do uh, multi-labelings. Um, so I really encourage you to um, check and to use the FP-based um, spectra viewer tool, which is a very um, convenient tool to check the uh, spectra compatibility. And you also have um, a very wide range of information about dyes, about fluorescent protein. This is a very, very uh, important uh, database. It's also important to optimize your sample and particularly to know uh, your tissue. For example, if you work in plants, there are a lot of things in plants, and I will not detail them, that induce autofluorescence. And this autofluorescence has to be taken into account in the choice of the, of the dye you are going to use to avoid um, the cross talking between autofluorescence and your dye. And also you have to protect your sample against photo bleaching and fading by using the appropriate illumination and the appropriate media. We will see that after. And finally, you have to optimize your observation to use uh, an optical system that is adapted to the fluorescence you are looking at. And for that, please come to see your favorite platforms, imaging platform, and they will help you to define the best system to um, properly observe your, your sample. The last uh, uh, thing, no, it's not the last thing, but something interesting in light microscopy is that um, in comparison to electron microscopy, um, to have access to the cell um, um, context, uh, we need to use staining. And we have a lot of tools that allows us to label cell compartments or organelles uh, that are fluorescent or conjugated to fluorescent dyes that we can use. Um, so you know all the DAPI, the UX to label the nuclei, you have cell, marker, uh, cell membrane marker like the cell mask, you can use uh, labels for mitochondria, for, lyso for lysosomes and uh, all range of uh, organelles in your cells that can be really useful uh, in combination with your labeling to uh, localize um, the context of your cell. And the last step for light microscopy is the, the necessity of the mounting media which is very important for the samples that are mounted in between slide and cover slip. Uh, it's an aqueous media in general based on glycerol, um, uh, containing glycerol, and it's important to keep the hydration and the fluorescence of your sample. You have two types of medias, the liquid one and the hardening one. Um, so in the hardening one, uh, you can make it yourself. The, the Moviol is a very used um, uh, hardening media that is very used in the lab and uh, easily done. But you can also buy some uh, prolonged uh, media from uh, some uh, from Thermo Fisher. So hardening means that the system is going to solidify. So at some point, you have a shrinking of your sample that can be, if you are really, really looking at 3D structure, that can be a problem. Uh, liquid media, an example of uh, very known uh, commercial media is the vector shield. But you can just do it yourself. Um, with a mix of PBS glycerol, like a 50% mix or 80% glycerol, 20% PBS, and you can have an observation media. If you do that, you don't have anti-fading agents, so your sample will not live too long, but at least you can look at them. What you have to keep in mind with the liquid media is that uh, the cover slips, they will be moving. Uh, they will not be fixed on the cover glass, so you will have to seal them to avoid movement and to avoid to um, completely destroy your sample. 
Okay, so we are done for the first part and the specificity in light microscopy. We can take a few minutes for questions and discussion if you have some uh, before switching to the EM specificity. Fabrice, do we have questions? If you want, you can directly activate your microphone and, uh, and we can answer the questions. Uh, Magali, uh, the non fluorescent uh, vernish, is it really necessary? Uh, how does it impact the, the imaging? Because up to now we used uh, classical uh, nail varnish and I don't think we had problem with it. So, so just the, the idea is just to use something which is non-fluorescent. I just put the brand of the vernis cochon because we use it in the lab for years and we know that it works. Okay. And a detail that is interesting also, it's that um, this, ver this varnish, you can buy it in a pharmacy. So it's working with CNRS with bond command. Ah, okay. That's so this is know. just practical information. <laughs> Uh, but then as soon as you find, uh, for example, the transparent varnish, the one that are medical in general are uh, non-fluorescent. Of course, if you use um, some colored varnish, you, will, you may have fluorescence, but uh, you can just test them. You put them on a slide and you go on the microscope and you check which one are fluorescent. And then when, once you have one that is convenient, it's okay. You can use okay. any brand. All right. Okay. Thank you. And maybe an additional thing is just look at the composition because uh, for some varnishes you will have things like acetone in the composition which may disturb uh, the sample as well so be careful about the composition and what is in the, the bottle okay thanks so just for our information the the male voice you just heard is uh, fabrice our colleague uh, from the facility <laughs> who is handling all the like technology <laughs> behind <laughs> <laughs> Is there any other questions? Uh, we will have other breaks to talk about if you need uh, to, to, to discuss, if you have something popping in your mind. Okay, so I'm gonna put back my mask and leave the stage to Melina. Thank you. Okay. So hello everybody. Um, so starting from uh, EM specificity. So, as uh, Magali explained until now, we have common step for immunolabelling. So it's really quite the same, but uh, the main difference is uh, the probe. So the first, the, the most common one, like with the fluorochrome influorescent microscopy is the gold particles. Um, so the gold particles will be coupled with a secondary antibody or sometimes with a first antibody. And you can also have some uh, gold particle linked to uh, a protein A or G. Uh, those particles have different size. So um, commonly between 5 and 15 nanometers. So you can uh, see it on the picture. Uh, we also have some ultra small nanoparticle uh, around 0 0.8 nanometers for the pre embedding technique. I will uh, just uh, make a short uh, explanation about the different technique of sample prep just after. And because of the very, very small size of uh, the gold particle, uh, we will need uh, an amplification for this one. Um, those particles, uh, because they have different size, uh, can be combined to make co-labeling. Uh, and we can also combine it uh, with a dab staining, I will explain it just after, uh, to, to, to target different, uh, different protein or uh, area in the sample. Um, has it's uh, made in gold, uh, it's really easy to detect it on the contrasted material. So as in uh, electron microscopy, we can see all the ultra structure. Um, it's really easy to know where uh, the protein is because you will have a dark point. Uh, just sometimes it's quite difficult with the ribosome, but uh, it's a particularity. And um, as it's combined with the secondary antibodies, uh, there is a limited uh, non-specific reaction. So it's something that is really easy to use 
and uh, the labeling will uh, mostly depend on the first antibody. So as I uh, already said, that we also can use the dab staining. So the dab staining is uh, the same that for uh, optical microscopy um, with a reaction of the dab with the HRP combined to a secondary antibody. Uh, and uh, the product uh, that is colored in brown in optical can be uh, dense to electron with the adding of osmium. And you can have those kind of um, uh, images. So here it's with uh, amyloid protein uh, in the brain. Uh, so you will see dark area uh, in the localization of your protein. Uh, this dab reaction can also be used with the apex constriction. So the apex constriction will generate uh, peroxidase in the cytosol of cells. And uh, with the reaction of DAP, you will be able to detect uh, your cells or region of interest uh, with DAC uh, area. So it can be seen in optical and then after in EM. So it's something that it's more and more used. So Apex uh, is expressed using a virus. Um, then something that maybe is more common for uh, those who do uh, fluorescent uh, microscopy is a couple of uh, avidin and biotin or streptavidin and biotin that can help also to make uh, amplification of the signal. So you have a very strong link between the biotin and the avidin and um, you will have some probe link to avidin or biotin, depend of what you have uh, in your lab. And the probe is a gold nanoparticle, so after easy to see under the TEM. Um, next, we have uh, one system uh, that is um, at the beginning dedicated to make uh, correlative microscopy, but can be used uh, easily uh, for other things, but not easily. But uh, so it's um, uh, an, um, an antibody, sorry, a couple with a fluorochrome. So you have the choice of the fluorochrome. And uh, in the same antibody, you have a, a nanogold uh, particle, so from of, uh, 1.4 nanometers. So it's the same for that for the ultra small that I explained in the first slide. You will need uh, then to make amplification. So you can have the same with the streptavidin, for example. And um, in those case, you uh, will be able to detect your pro protein first in fluorescence and then after amplification and the uh, EM process, so electron microscopy sample prep, you will be able to detect it uh, under the TEM uh, thanks to uh, the gold particle. And uh, Magali uh, will speak a little bit about uh, quantum dots that can be used in fluorescence. It can also be used uh, uh, in electron microscopy because um, there is a core shell that is dense to electrons. So after you can, as you can see on the picture, uh, you can uh, easily here uh, detect uh, the different uh, quantum dots on the TEM uh, images. So after you can make correlation between fluorescence and uh, the localization in uh, EM uh, on your sample. So here it was the different probes that we can use. But uh, as I already say, and as maybe as those of you have uh, already uh, seen the first workshop for EM, we need a specific sample prep. And this sample prep is uh, beginning with a chemical fixation. Uh, so more and more, and uh, mostly in electron microscopy, we need a very good fixation, first to uh, keep the ultrastructure and then to keep the antigenicity. But it's very important for us to keep the ultrastructure as we can see the entire structure under the TEM. Uh, you can't not, um, um, comment you Light, Light sorry. Uh, but uh, so uh, Magali say a word about that, and it's really, really important. Uh, glutaraldehyde can modify the epitope, so we need to use a very, very small amount of glutaraldehyde in, uh, in EM. So we say that at the maximum it's 0 0.5. In fact, it's more often around 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 
after it's too strong. But the problem is that uh, glutaraldehyde help a lot in keeping the ultra structure because it's uh, stronger uh, in the fixation. So how we need to find a balance between ultra structure and uh, immunolabelic, immunolabelling sensitivity. Uh, I will show you uh, firstly different uh, family of uh, technical approach and um, how we can choose between these different technical approach. Uh, first, it will depend of your sample type. Uh, and then about, uh, uh, it will depend of the protein of interest that you want to see. Uh, then, of course, it will depend on your biological, uh, biological condition, uh, if there is some specificity about your question or environment. And the quality of the antibodies is, of course, very, very important, more in EM. And if you need or not uh, to make some collaborating, it will um, make the choice. Um, so. Uh, you have the link of the uh, of the first workshop on YouTube. You can also go go to the channel of uh, the Bordeaux Imaging Center to find the video. But we will uh, give you all the different link at the end of the first workshop and and this one to receive it after. Um, so in EM, uh, the sample prep uh, is important because we need to to have a sample that is hard enough to be sliced in thin section. Because in TEM, we observe a sample uh, that is sliced in 70 nanometers, so it's really small. Um, the sample, because of the electron, have to be resistant to the beam. And if you want to have an image, you need to have something that is contrasted because you need interaction with the electron to, to, to have this image in uh, grayscale. And yes, you need, of course, if you want to make immunolabelling, keep the antigenicity. So there is different way to go. I will detail a little bit uh, those different. Uh, the first that is uh, more near of a fluorescent microscopy is the pre-embedding labeling. Why we call it pre-embedding is because we will do the immunolabeling uh, before preparing the sample for EM. So it's uh, for all kinds of samples, so tissue, adherent cells, uh, microorganisms, and so on. Uh, you can do simple labeling or double labeling with DAB only. And uh, it will, uh, so it, it's really not easy, but uh, you will make chemical fixation. Then you do immunolabeling with your first antibody saturation, as uh, uh, Magali explained. You will add the secondary antibody coupled with an ultra small uh, beads, make amplification to be sure that you will see it after on the, under the TM, and then make dehydration and resin embedding. Uh, uh, before doing the sectioning, so in ultra small, in a ultra thin section, and then go to the observation. The major uh, advantage of this technique is the high sensitivity because you just have chemical fixation. So the all the antigen are quite accessible and it's heavy metal compatible. Uh, <laughs> why I say that? that in, I say that a sample to be observed uh, with a TEM need to be contrasted. In fact, uh, in, uh, in, in HEM, the contrast is given by heavy metal because a simple biological sample is done in, um, uh, in uh, light uh, atom. So we need to have heavy metal. So here, for example, we can add some osmium or ac uh, uranium acetate, and it will give a good contrast, so a, a good structure there. But the limitation is that if you had a gold nanoparticle on an antibody, it will uh, decrease the capacity to go inside the tissue, for example. So you have a limited thickness of the labeling. Uh, as you, you will have just one uh, choice in the gold size, you can't do a lot of co-labeling, except with the DAB labeling, but it's not a specific localization of a protein. And sometimes, oh, very often, depend on the sample, the ultrastructure can be affected by uh, the permeabilization because it makes some hole to allow to, to, to go through the sample. So it affected it. At the opposite, we have the post-embedding labeling. So as the name uh, is saying it, uh, 
you will do the labeling after making uh, the embedding. So you will do chemical fixation, resin embedding, and then do thin section and the immunolabeling on this section uh, put on the, on the grid, EM grid. Um, here, they develop specific resin. So it's the acrylic resin dedicated to immunolabeling. They allow to have access to the epitope at the surface, of the, uh, the surface sorry, of the of the section. Um, we can do post embedding in the different kind of sample, and as it's uh, done with uh, gold particles, so from five to fifteen or twenty gold particle size, you can do co labeling. It's also possible to make a fluorescent imaging on it because you can not use a gold particle, but a fluorescent uh, secondary antibody and go uh, to a fluorescent microscopy. We do this sometimes, uh, depend of your question or the, of the, or the development that we are done. Um, so one of the major advantage uh, in opposite of the pre-embedding, so when you do the pre-embedding, you have your label once forever. Here, as you just have your tissue in the block, it's very simple to make a uh, section and section and do different labeling with a different kind of protein that you want to see. Um, and after different kind of co-labeling uh, uh, until the end of, of your sample in the block. Limitation is that you will have a low sensitivity because uh, you, you will make labeling at the surface of the, of the section so it says that the entire epitope needs to be at the surface of the section to be detected. There is no penetration. And sometimes due to the dehydration and the resin embedding, you will uh, lost a part of the, not sometimes, very often, uh, a part of the sensitivity, in fact. So you will really decrease the amount of labeling that is possible. And uh, because here we can't use a lot of EV metal, the ultrastructure will be affected. EV metal, <laughs> so it's uh, 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 you you lost a, a part of of the resolution of the structure. Uh, also, it depends of of the sample, of course, and uh, the capacity to fix it. But uh, there is an um, an effect uh, on the structure. In the family of the post embedding labeling, there is a, a particular technique called the Tokuyashu technique. So the Tokuyashu technique uh, is a very whole technique. Uh, so you start with a chemical fixation and then after have a um, sucrose uh, embedding impregnation, you freeze directly in liquid nitrogen. After uh, you make cryo sectioning of your sample, so it's also 70 nanometers uh, thick uh, section, you do immunolabeling on it and after go to the observation. So this technique is uh, able in um, tissue and cell suspension and microorganisms. Um, you can also, like for the pre precedent one, do simple or double labeling with gold particles. You can add some DAB too. Uh, it's also compatible with fluorescence mi uh, microscopy. Uh, it's also a technique that uh, can help keep the fluorescence inside the section because you don't have any dehydration. So the, the section is still a little bit hydrated. And as you don't have any dehydration, any resin, you have here a very sensitive method uh, because it causes the uh, less uh, modification of your epitope, maybe just the one due to the chemical fixation. And after you don't have a penetration inside the section, but a little bit uh, due to the shape of this section that is not in plastic. Um, the limitation is the same. So you just have a surface label. So compared to a fluorescence microscopy, you will uh, lost a, a, a part of the amount of labeling that you, 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 you are used to see when you do fluorescent microscopy, but you have something that is sensitive so you can have quite a good amount of labeling. Um, it's not adequate for soluble protein because you, uh, during the processing of um, sucrose, for example, you can lose uh, a part of, the, of those protein. Uh, it's really difficult uh, to make adherent cells with this technique. So for example, here, if your project is on adherent cells, so 
cells that have to be kept adherent during the processes, we can't use this technique. Um, and it used a very low amount of EV metal <laughs> and uh, just some uranium acetate to keep a little bit uh, the structure. But here, as we don't have a lot of EV metal, the membrane is, uh, uh, so the contrast is inverted, in fact, and you will have the membrane in white and uh, all the, the rest of the material in a gray scale. So Monica will show you after uh, one example. And just one word, we can also do some uh, isolated particle labeling. So for example, when you have some uh, um, extraction of a vesicle or synaptosome or uh, some uh, isolated per, per organelle, you can, after chemical fixation, directly uh, put it on a grid and have to do the immunolabeling directly on it. Uh, it's possible only if you have an extracellular target because we will not permeabilize it, um, but it's uh, possible. So you will have a very high sensitivity as we have nothing that will modify the structure and we can add some heavy metal. So after uh, the structure is quite good. So after you have done an EM uh, um, immunolabeling, you need have to to analyze it so it's it's uh, uh, normal but you have to keep in mind some uh, different things first of all uh, before uh, doing an immunolabeling in uh, electron microscopy it's uh, mandatory to know very well your mm -hmm. antibody reaction and um, most of all to have done some fluorescence microscopy before because sometimes uh, even if it's work in EF, we, it will not work in EM, and we need to collect the different information that you will have in uh, immunofluorescence uh, before doing EM because it will uh, allow to, to, to decrease the different possibility that we had to, uh, for example, the concentration of the antibody and to discriminate area of, uh, of interest or to, to, to observe because we will be on a very small volume, a very small section of the sample. So uh, it can be very hard if we don't have uh, those information before. And then, uh, as I already say, but it's really important, you will have a label just at the surface of the section and a very thin section, or very small section. Um, so it decreases really, really a lot the amount of label that you can have. So for those of you that make a lot of immunofluorescence, for example, you will maybe uh, don't understand why uh, we can say you have two gold on the membrane. Yes, it's a good label uh, because you are <laughs> you have a lot of fluorescence, but we are something that it's at the surface on a very small part of the sample. Um, so it's what I said. Uh, so it's also a thing that if you have something that is very rare, so that are not in the entire sample or it just in some spots, we need to find uh, some uh, trick and trips after to, to, to find it. Uh, Monica will show you after an example where we use DAB to find uh, an area of interest, or you can also use some correlative uh, microscopy, so Monica will explain it uh, a little bit after. And one thing that is important also is that you have to pay attention uh, at the distance. So yes, we have for most of the time two antibody with a secondary couple with a gold particle. And it will always depend where the gold particle fall. So uh, a membrane thickness is around 10 nanometers. So um, because of, of the resolution given by the sample prep in EM. So sometimes we, we think that it's inside of a compartment. And in fact, it's not. It's just because of the distance between the protein and the gold particle. So in those kind of things, when you want to be sure that you have something inside the compartment, uh, you need to make some analyze like quantification of localization. Uh, uh, it's uh, will not possible to make a, a real quantification of the presence of a uh, protein, but you can uh, do a quantification of the localization. Troubleshooting. <laughs> so the, 
uh, I, I will ex um, uh, detail some troubleshooting. It's uh, not only for EM, it's uh, for fluorescence and EM microscopy. Uh, first, you can have a staining that is very weak. There is some reason uh, that are possible. Uh, first, the antibody doesn't reach the antigen. So in this case, you can try another fixation method uh, or use a masking method uh, like eating or enzymatic reaction. You can also increase the incubation duration and decreasing in the same time the temperature uh, because you always need a balance between temperature and duration to have a specific label after. And you can also uh, increase the temperature of your incubation uh, and, uh, around uh, 37 uh, degrees. So it's uh, for uh, fluorescent microscopy. Maybe your staining is very weak because uh, the saturation, uh, you, you don't have, have saturate your antigen, so you don't have in, uh, enough antibody. So you need to increase the amount of primary antibody and maybe the duration of your um, incubation. Something that is very rare but possible, you don't have saturate your primary antibody, so you need uh, to increase the amount of uh, secondary antibody uh, in your incubation. Or you have a very weak expression of the target. So maybe you need to use amplification system. So I described just before, for example, uh, the couple, uh, the, the possibility to use uh, biotin streptavidine. Or uh, you can use polyclonal antibody or combination of different monoclonal antibody. Uh, you can also use several secondary antibody. Um, and maybe if uh, there is no other solution or those one uh, doesn't answer to, to the problem, you can also maybe basically, as uh, Magali explained uh, some slide ago, uh, to control the sample antigenicity simply. And uh, for EM, if you you have this problem of the expression of the target. For example, you can uh, change the method or go to the pre-embedding method. Uh, other troubleshooting that can appear, it's an important background. So maybe <laughs> the most common one uh, with non-specific signal. So first you have to be sure of the specificity of your antibodies. Uh, you can decrease uh, antibodies concentration. You can also increase the saturation. Um, so it, it can be uh, in terms of uh, time or uh, concentration of the blocking agents. You can also try different uh, saturating agents. So for example, uh, Magali speak about BSA. We can use uh, acetylate BSA that have a different shape and give uh, a different uh, type of saturation. You can also increase washes. So washes, are, are, as Magali said, are really important in terms of volume duration and agitation. For example, um, in uh, pre-embedding uh, technique, uh, I had some problems some week ago and I go to the um, Orion sites because they give a lot of different protocol. And the washes after uh, the first and the second antibody are around one hour. So it's really long, but it's what will give the best result after in terms of specificity. Um, you can also play in as uh, a couple of temperature and duration for antibody incubation. Um, and for example, if it's possible, uh, decrease the temperature because it gives a more specific level. Um, and you can also uh, do uh, for um, try to control for multiple staining uh, the probabilities to have a cross talk. So you can maybe use cross absorbed secondary antibody. And to finish, if it's the first time you have to do an immunolabeling, you can uh, you you need some information that maybe you can find uh, in the data sheet of the antibody. So it's more for immunofluorescence because in EM we are broadly information on it. Uh, you can also check papers from the field and optimize, optimize from there. You can, of 
cruise, please come on, contact your favorite imaging facility because uh, we have different people that can help with different expertise. So come on, uh, come to find us and ask, just simply ask. Uh, and don't forget uh, that you have technical network and uh, most of the time they are very happy to share tips and tricks. To uh, finish, uh, we, uh, we have made this uh, quick um, table to uh, how to choose uh, immunolabeling approach for my question. So we show you different way with different uh, advantage and limitation. Um, so for example, uh, if you need a, a, a global repartition of your protein uh, in, uh, in a tissue, maybe it's uh, faster and easier to go to fluorescent and enough to go to fluorescent microscopy. Uh, if you need to have the ultrastructure context, maybe it will be uh, better to go to electron microscopy. Um, of course, if you want to do live imaging, it's impossible to do electron microscopy, but okay. So it depends on your question. You have here a quick uh, review of uh, where you can go um, to, to, to find the good technique. So if you have any questions. Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, it's more about the sample preparation for light imaging. Um, if um, you would work with uh, thick sections, thick tissue sections, I mean, between uh, 50 and 100 micrometers thick, um, how would you, which modification would you bring to the sample preparation protocol? What would you add, for example, to have the best imaging? Is it, can we generalize or is it tissue, really tissue specific? Okay, um, so can you say yeah, more? Okay. <laughs> Hopla, I'm back. Um, so what kind of tissue are you talking about? Bone. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Bone. <laughs> I was ready to any tissue. <laughs> not tissue. Deca decalcified bone. Thank oh, you. Decalcified. Oh, good. Decalcified. <laughs> um, so I think we already discussed together, no? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, what is, so what is, but, what is but, your problem? Because but, um, if it seems that, okay, um, it's not just, I don't have a, a general protocol. Um, yeah. Okay. In bones, what is complicated uh, is the, the, the calcification. So apparently you already have this step done. So then uh, you will have uh, to slice it at some point. Um, and you said that you have uh, slices that are around uh, 100 uh, micron. Yes. Yeah, it's the order, okay. Um, so uh, then the, the problem in tissue is uh, a little bit uh, what Melina said for uh, pre-embedding technique is the accessibility of the antigen. Um, so um, first you can try, um, so I would try just with a simple, uh, the better uh, at the beginning. So what we said, uh, simple saturation, simple incubation, uh, simple permeabilization and see what it gives. If it doesn't work, <laughs> uh, the two steps you have to play on are uh, permeabilization. In tissue, you can afford a, a stronger permeabilization than in, uh, in cell culture, for example. Uh, and also something in tissue in light microscopy that we often do is uh, unmasking of antigen depending on the fixative you use, because in general in tissue, you, you can use also um, other type of fixative um, so the unmasking can really help uh, to find the, the, the epitopes. Uh, so you can use either uh, eating uh, in a dry uh, oven, oven and, um, or um, enzymatic using pepsin or papain uh, solution incubation to unmask the antigens. Um, okay. 
so this you you have it's always the same you will have to try different range different duration different concentration until you find a good uh, thing so what i would do is that if i don't know at all the antibody i'm trying and particularly on a difficult tissue like bone um, i would um, look in the in the um, in the literature find an antibody that works really well like some like a reference antibody and always have it as a second uh, labeling to test the, the experiment by itself and then being able to evaluate your specific antibody um, conditions I don't know okay if yeah. and what do you think about tissue clearing like I think the best about uh, tissue clearing <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, so no, okay. just um, so tissue clearing is a, a technique that is developed since a few years now um, to allow uh, more accessibility in imaging. Uh, so to be able, instead of slicing your tissue, to use it as a whole organ uh, to look at the whole organ in one shot, in one sample. Um, it has advantages and inconvenience, of course. Um, the main advantage is that you have the whole tissue. I have absolutely no idea about clearing in bones. But okay. on the facility, team. we have an expert in clearing techniques, which is called Jérémy Taillon. Okay. I don't know if he's uh, listening now, but uh, voilà. So uh, don't hesitate to uh, contact Jérémy. <laughs> and yes, I'm uh, just uh, pushing him under the bus, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I, I was thinking more about clearing on, on just this, uh, these sections, not on the whole, yeah. um, the so, whole so, tissue. So, Maybe it could help to, to image. Uh, so uh, the clearing on section is also something you can do. Um, as soon as you will modify the, the structure of the sample, you can modify the access to epitopes. So maybe it's something you could try. OK. OK, thank but you. I have no experience with that, so that's why I'm really uh, cautious. OK, thank you. This is Lysiane. Hey, Lysiane. <laughs> if I can, I just uh, want to add some uh, ID that uh, I tested in the past. When uh, I had uh, some troubles with uh, immunolabeling, sometimes uh, the solution for me is a modification of pH um, of the buffer and uh, also uh, the osmo osmolarity of the buffer. In fact, it's, um, these uh, two parameters are very important sometimes to uh, modify the background or to optimize uh, the specificity. In EM or fluorescence? Uh, in fact, in EM for me, but I think it's the same for EF. Yeah, I think it's, it's really important. Um, also, you would find a different uh, washing buffer or um, exactly. um, in the literature, for example, depending on the structure you're looking at. For example, if you um, put two person, one working on membrane protein and the other one working on cytoskeleton, you will have a, a big fight about the, the, um, how the fixation should be done and how the, the buffer should be used. Um, yeah. So yeah, for example, the FEM for uh, cytoskeleton. So what you don't see is that Fabrice, who is uh, uh, used to cytoskeleton, is making big signs <laughs> behind the camera with uh, uh, <laughs> something saying FEM. Yeah. So yeah, you have specific medias for, so that's why it's important to always look at the literature and the oldest paper on the immunolabeling in the literature are generally the ones that uh, have the good recipes. And in fact, it's true for the fixation, but also for the labeling. Mm. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. All, yeah. The, all the buffers, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye, <laughs> <laughs> Lisiane. Bye. She's listening. <laughs> Other questions? No questions in the chat for now. So feel free to, to ask questions. Uh, otherwise, we will move on. OK, so we're going to move on with Monica presenting you all the applications we can do uh, on the beak with immunolabelings. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here and uh, to show you some of the beautiful images we uh, generate in the Bordeaux Imaging Center. 
uh, for uh, with our immunolabeling application, actually. Uh, I would like to introduce you uh, some concept that is going to be they are going to be important in during the presentation. Okay, so they they have been said uh, already, but uh, we want to really point out that sample preparation mainly depends on the thickness and nature of the specimen. One of the questions that we had before, they were talking about it is uh, bone is the nature of the bone itself, but also the thickness. She was worried about the, if it's slice, uh, it can be possible to do clearing. It's possible, of course, uh, everything is possible, but it's important also that you see if you can uh, do it uh, as much thinner as possible, it's much better for you, for the penetration of the body, for the, the labeling. Uh, but the better will be the, uh, the, the signal to nose ratio during the acquisition and the better will be then the, uh, the resolution. So yes, going to the thickness is the most important thing. Having said that, I am really good news uh, for this uh, last uh, speaker is that the light microscopy now clearing techniques uh, that make the biological sample really transparent but also expansion microscopy that increase the size of the sample uh, for better observation have revolutionized light microscopy field. It means I, I will show you some examples. I don't want to go really further on that because we have a specific, uh, we will have a specific maybe uh, workshop on these techniques uh, one day. And uh, we can, you know, of course you can come to the, the, uh, the facility to talk to us and to, to have more questions about these uh, techniques. Uh, I have also really great news for the electron microscopy, uh, the immunolabeling becomes more and more accessible. Now we have a much better production of antibodies and even nanobodies. We have a new alternatives to classical gold particles like uh, Melina's plane, uh, nano, part, nano gold, uh, ultra small, uh, fluoro nano gold. Uh, so we can play around that and the pre-embedding -label, pre labeling is becoming more and more used uh, in the in electron facility, electron microscopy facilities. Uh, and also we have a new molecular constructs. Uh, we have to transfect uh, the cells and we have to modify uh, genetically, but they are really, really uh, nice for correlative application like uh, Apex2 peroxidase and the system of the transistane and the RIA system that they are based in the DAB uh, labeling. So uh, at the end, I will say a little bit the different work, workflows we use in the facility. I don't want to uh, go really deep on, into that because we will have, uh, Magali already announced it, uh, a workshop in CLEM at the, in, in the autumn, in the in fall. So I will do a sketch of uh, what is the, the best uh, approaches we have in the in the lab. And uh, I, we, we think really that is the best localization, the best, the good choice, the best choice to obtain the best localization of the target protein. So we are talking about uh, localizing the protein in uh, really in high resolution. This is a very good uh, choice. So what about resolution in monolabeling? Of course, the uh, resolution, it will depend mostly in the, in the system we use here. I, I give you some examples, of course, not uh, all of the system and the microscopes you can have, but uh, really the uh, range of uh, resolution is huge uh, between the, you know, the, 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 the big samples and the we are gonna image with lights in microscopes uh, and to the electron microscope that is the Creo electron microscope is the more resolutive ones. So, but I, let me show you some of the, how it looks, the, the samples that we are going to ima image in this uh, type of microscope, because I think it's important to, to have an idea of what are you uh, manipulating, actually, the format. Uh, these are, uh, for example, two uh, mountains of, uh, to do uh, big samples imaging. So these have been clear, cleared uh, normally with uh, different techniques for clearing. And uh, this is a mountain of, uh, this is a, a plant and this has to be mobilized. Uh, and we are gonna observe the, the root uh, with uh, agarose in a, in a holder. And this is a brain that in the lab, uh, we, we've been de doing with Jeremy for uh, uh, ultra microscope uh, imaging. So this is normally wow. this, uh, um, samples are fluorescent already, and we are uh, installing them. Uh, it's important the multimedia that you're going to use uh, for the, the imaging and the installation of these, uh, these samples. But now we, it's possible to do the big samples, the large samples like that, and the 
in, and they are, but they have to be transparent. You are more used to this kind of uh, uh, sample, samples, like uh, you need to slice your tissue with the, this kind of uh, machines, uh, that is uh, slicers, uh, that is a cryostat, but you have also that you, you're, you will cut your tissue then in, in, uh, that is frozen, but you have also uh, the possibility to do it in a uh, temperature with a vibroton, for example, but it's uh, gonna be a little bit thick, uh, the, the, this sample, but you can do floating uh, immunolabeling that is kind of practical. Then you mount it in your slices like that, in normally serial sections, but uh, it can be also individual sections to go uh, really for high resolution uh, microscopy. And then mm, cell cultures, of course, uh, they need to be cultured uh, if you want to go uh, after the immunolabeling uh, to, in glass cover slips. Uh, this is uh, some of the examples of the plates uh, you can uh, use for that. Uh, but also you can do individual uh, cover slips and they have to be really uh, adequate uh, for the resolution. And here I, I point out uh, the thickness, that is the number of the thickness of the cover slip we use uh, normally in the, in the Bordeaux Imaging Center to do super resolution, but also for confocal imaging, is, they are much better. And then this is the format we have uh, normally for electron microscopy. This is uh, the mounting uh, holders for the uh, scanning electron microscope, but also normally in, in electron microscopy, you have to cut and slice and cut and slice and do it as smaller as smaller as possible because uh, you have a better penetrability of the defixate, say, fixators, you need to hydrate, uh, dehydrate the sample, so it's better for dehydration, and the embedding uh, of the resin inside the tissue. So you need to do it uh, really small, and that is like, uh, it, it looks like when you have uh, the final uh, solution. These, uh, these um, blocks, uh, you are gonna install it in an ultra microtome, then you are gonna cut with a diamond knife, and here in 17 nanometers slices that they are presented in here, then you are gonna deposit in a small uh, uh, grid and uh, three millimeters and it's going inside of a electron microscope. This, there's no choice. We have no choice on that. We have to go in this kind of, uh, for transmission, we need to go for, in this uh, support. This is an example of what it, could, it looks like to do an immunolabeling post embedding. So this is that you have your slides in here and then you could put some drops with antibodies and then you only will have, uh, will uh, stain or label the, uh, the surface of this, uh, this uh, slice. So for big samples, what I was saying, uh, you need a very long incubation with antibodies. Uh, so PWIS, that is the brain that we were seeing before with uh, the fluorescent inside. So uh, you need a strong permeabilization with triton and solvents and equal, this uh, protocol it will depend clearly uh, in the uh, method that you're gonna use. Uh, we have a now a really batch of uh, different methods. It's going to be depending on what you want to do, if you want to do immunolabeling or not. But is this uh, clarity, you disco, I disco, cubic map, uh, etc. So come to the lab and talk to our specialist at Jeremy. We are doing the okay. cube. <laughs> <laughs> because he, uh, he will uh, decide what it was the, the best method for your, your sample. The resolution levels here is gonna be limited because uh, we have uh, the, the imaging and the, the big samples. You will need uh, objectives and they are work, a long working distance, so they are not already uh, resolutive, but uh, you can also uh, go for confocal and multiphoton uh, acquisition and then uh, to obtain a little bit more resolution. Uh, what we have in the lab is a uh, ultra microscope from LaVision and actually uh, you generate a uh, light sheet in the sample, which uh, intrinsically section your sample uh, with the light and then an objective that is perpendicular to this section. And then you will be uh, able to uh, really fun in a really fast way and uh, low photo bleaching to uh, uh, generate the image of the full sample. This is an example from a, a group here in, uh, in Bordeaux. Uh, uh, with the help of Jeremy, of course, uh, and this uh, mass lung, the, then they used uh, the, the clearing method IDISCO. Uh, they were immunolabeling the smooth uh, muscle cells, uh, as, as you can see here in, in, in gold uh, staining. 
and uh, they had uh, one week of uh, sample preparation and the imaging it was done with an uh, ultra microscope for several hours so that is a nice example we have much more examples but we don't want to we are run out of time um, that is the normal uh, samples that you are going to be uh, exposed to is the uh, tissue in, in, in your uh, slides. Uh, we have uh, with this kind of uh, sample, we can also do a scanner, really uh, automatize a scanner of these uh, lamels and then you could uh, even do a, a 3D reconstruction. We can do confocal, spinning deep, even some super resolution in this kind of uh, samples, we, they are pretty thin. And then that is the, uh, the format for electron microscopy. Uh, tissue from tissue and thick samples, we can do uh, all, many of the techniques uh, uh, in, in microscopy. But also, of course, uh, you need relatively long incubation with antibodies, strong permeabilization, and the resolution level is it varies uh, depending on uh, we are doing a light or electron microscopy. So one nice example in the in the in the facility was with a group of uh, here in Bordeaux of, of Christophe Muller from uh, uh, mouse models of affected disease. Uh, we wanted they wanted to know what is the, the, they were these accumulations of uh, APP, which is an amyloid protein, in the brain, and they were using uh, confocal microscopy. They were using multi-labeling uh, the APP proteins with uh, this counter staining that Magali was talking about with synaptic protein spray and post synaptics proteins. And here they realized and actually this APP accumulation, they were more localized with presynaptic than postsynaptic, but they, they wanted, to, they needed to see the nature of these uh, presynaptic accumulations, uh, these uh, APP accumulations, and they went to, to Melina to do a double uh, immune staining of this protein APP to localize the, uh, the, the dark uh, um, um, or, uh, accumulations of APP. And they realized that actually uh, the, the uh, nivel, uh, a structure, ultra structural level, this, uh, stru this uh, um, accumulation were in multivesicular bodies and they were associated to presynaptic proteins in this, uh, in this uh, um, uh, tissue. So for this uh, uh, example, they used the Tokuyasu method because it was the most direct and more sensitive uh, um, method to, to work with. In another order of, uh, we, we talk a lot of neuroscience because we are really, uh, I am a neuroscientist, uh, in, in former neuroscientist, and, but also because uh, we have a lot of people that is coming from neuroscience to our facility. So this is our genotypic hippocampal slice. Uh, they are typical to, uh, you can cultivate, to culture this uh, slice and uh, keep them in an incubator for weeks and then you can manipulate them and transfect them, and infect them and do uh, many things on the, to them. Uh, and the, here is a, a single cell electroporation and the, with a group of Mathieu uh, Letelier and Oliver Tumin that they are, were overexpressing different proteins, TFP and the neuroligand one, and it was modified to be biotinylated. Then when the, this neuroligand biotinylate is in the surface, we can use a streptavidin, uh, fluorescent streptavidin to stain this uh, labeling, and then uh, uh, see that uh, we have a beautiful picture here of this labeling in live cells. The point here is that the, the user, this uh, user, they wanted to see a little bit more further in the structure of these uh, uh, accumulations of uh, neural ligand in the synapse or uh, associated to synapse. So we uh, do a spansion microscopy, which uh, what uh, is four uh, times more uh, bigger the sample. And it's uh, also a technique that we could call a clearing technique because it they all also make it transparent. And uh, and do some confocal microscopy on it. So that is how it looks like. Uh, really, we needed to do immunolabeling of TFP to uh, amplify the signal, and we can see here the labeling of this extracellular neural ligand, and it's very nice in the spines. And we can do 3D reconstruction of these spines, and you see that they are really, really uh, are surrounding the the whole uh, structure. Uh, in the same kind of samples, we have organotypic spokampal slide from mice brain. Uh, in this case, uh, we express uh, AMPA receptors that they are also modified to be biotinylated. 
in the extracellular site, and then we use in this time fluoronanogold particles uh, to uh, to level them in fluorescence. So that is the, the Melina already introduced this kind of uh, of uh, molecules. Uh, in when you uh, live uh, level the, these uh, slices, you can see really pretty well uh, the staining of the extracellular AMPA receptors in the in the dendrite, and very specifically. Then you can uh, even do some live imaging uh, with these uh, um, molecules and with this fluorescence. But and then uh, you, this uh, molecule can, uh, allows you to do conventional EM sample preparation after silver enhancement. So you fix your, uh, your uh, tissue, you do silver enhancement, and then you uh, uh, look at them, observe them in transmission, and you can see that the, the labeling is much more precise and we have a really a huge uh, uh, precision of these uh, AMPA receptors in the spines, and we can even quantify what is the number of clusters that you find in the, in the in different compartments when you compare the different compartments in the tissue. Another example of uh, electron microscopy, this is a, a Cabernet Sauvignon, grape berry skin. Of course, we are in Bordeaux. We have this kind of uh, samples always. And the user wanted to do post-embedding pectin immunoval labeling. Um, for that, they used uh, this acrylic resin in embedding. And uh, the, the uh, immunolabel called uh, with uh, 10 nanometers particles. And then we could see uh, the uh, different distribution, the pectin in this uh, um, uh, skin and of the, uh, the grapes, and which is a marker of maturation of these uh, plants. And also another example was that Melina already introduced is the Apex 2 uh, with peroxidase. Uh, that it was expressed with, with a viral system in brain. And then you have to uh, do, a, of course, a extraction of the tissue, uh, really slicing and doing it really small. Uh, do pre-embedding monostaining with that, like that we could see where is the, was the peroxidation express, and then you can see, uh, you can follow actually the different uh, uh, prolongations uh, of the, the neurons. And then you do, uh, is compatible with heavy metal staining, as you can see here, and that they allow us to do transmission electron microscopy, but also we could do seriac block phase uh, scanning electron microscopy. And finally, thin samples, uh, the incubation, of course, they are gonna be uh, shorter. There's a light permeabilization here. Always remember that for uh, electron microscopy, there are some specifications and the resolution levels. Uh, we can go really, really uh, far uh, to, depending on the system we use. Okay, now we introduce a little bit another microscope too, that is uh, for single molecule localization microscopy. We will have a workshop on that too, so I don't, I won't be really, really uh, deep in the, in this techniques, but I want to show some examples. Uh, this is a uh, uh, cell culture, uh, classical culture from primary cells or uh, cell lines, and uh, we do a uh, double immunolabeling or th uh, triple immunolabeling to localize proteins in the different compartments. And of course, we can con consider staining a uh, labeling here with a uh, cytoskeleton protein, here with a. Uh, um, oh, disappeared. With a uh, mitochondrial protein. Ah, there's no pointer anymore. Uh, is thinking. Okay. Okay. Don't worry. Doesn't worry. Doesn't matter. I go on. So, yeah. Uh, and uh, this is a neuron, for example, uh, that we apply a super resolution technique. Uh, this is a fixed cell. Uh, with a conventional immunostaining, a classical immunostaining. These uh, cells, they were mounted in a special medium to, to do a stead. Uh, we choose a uh, best medium that was matching with our system. And uh, this uh, system, this uh, technique, uh, uh, the idea is to deplete uh, the uh, flora fronts in the outer region of the uh, uh, diffraction limited spot with a stead uh, uh, laser here with a donut shape. And then we are going to increase the resolution a lot of, because uh, we are increase the precision of uh, localization. So here, this is a normal picture of confocal microscope. And then 
when you do a stead, you, you, you can uh, actually separate uh, both compartments that it wasn't really possible with confocal microscopy. So we increase, uh, we can use the same preparation to do uh, two different uh, um, uh, micro, um, techniques in microscopy. Here, this is another one of pro super resolution is the, the, we increase the resolution to 10 nanometers sometimes. Uh, this is the same preparation in conventional immunostaining, but this covers if they need to be uh, immersed in a storm medium that will have uh, some reducing agents and it's important for this technique. Oh, how are you dark? Oh, I say it's okay. Uh, I am <laughs> moving away. <laughs> So um, the storm technique actually relies on the stochastic activation on the individual pleurophores in the sample, and, uh, and they have a, which they have a photoactivatable properties, and these pleurophores blink in a, between uh, two states, and then you are uh, detecting them, uh, all of them, uh, after a thousand images. Uh, then you have a dedicated uh, software that they will localize the coordinates of these uh, protophores and with the time you will be able to reconstruct the localization and really uh, very in precise manner. Here you can see that we can distinguish the different structures and we weren't able to, to see before, like here, uh, these uh, uh, stripped uh, um, structures. And finally, uh, because I like expansion a lot and I want to, to introduce it a little bit like a, a new thing in the, in the big, uh, this, uh, also this uh, conventional, again, uh, immunostaining that been, we've been doing with the other uh, examples, uh, we can expand these uh, cells actually and uh, as in, instead our um, single molecule localization, we can uh, actually uh, um, be able to detect uh, structures that we weren't able to see before. That is for confocal microscopy. And that is also very practical in expansion microscopy because we can do uh, 3D reconstructions very easily and see uh, more in detail the, the structures. Uh, for electron microscopy, here is a gist pellet uh, that we do a um, mitochondrial labeling uh, with the Tokuyoshi techniques. So they are freezing the pellet and then do, we do the microscopy. We can see very well the structures, uh, as Melina was saying, of the membrane of the mitochondria and the labeling of the 10 nanometer uh, particles. And finally, Another uh, example of application in uh, electron microscopy that is accompanied also with uh, an, um, a quantification. This, uh, this uh, samples are, uh, this time is cryofixated with a high pressure freezing and freeze substitution then for, for to be embedded with a resin that preserves uh, the antigenicity. Then they cut the, the, the specimen and they do a post embedding monogol with two different uh, particle size and then do, do transmission EM. And then they are able to discern both the size of the, uh, uh, the, 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 gold, the, the gold particles and to uh, quantify the distribution, the total distribution between the different compartments in the cells. So conclusions, the final conclusions, the full organ and organism require long time incubation and strong permeabilization. These samples can be uh, imaged directly uh, thanks to the use of clearing techniques. So don't hesitate to come to us uh, if you want to, to, to try and to see if it's possible to do it. The examples need optimization of fixation and permeabilization antibody concentration. For electron microscopy, please, uh, we never say it enough. Be careful with the, uh, the permeabilization. So when resolution is convention, conventional microscopy is limited by diffraction. Alternatives in light microscopy are re super resolution techniques and expansion microscopy. Again, come to us because we are several of us and we are doing this kind of techniques. An electron microscopy, of course, they guess the best resolution to localize your protein of interest in addition of an ultra context. But it's the most uh, difficult, uh, but don't be scared because we have the really good specialist in here to, to do it. 
So just uh, this uh, little sketch to tell you what we are doing in this uh, correlative, uh, like in CLEM on correlative lighting electron microscopy in the VIC. Uh, this is uh, an overview of the different techniques we can do. Uh, it's a continuum between uh, the techniques we are been showing you about uh, light uh, microscopy with chemical fixation and uh, cryofixation. And of course, we have a different uh, work uh, workflows now to do immunogold labeling, to do light imaging, or oh yeah, light microscopy, sorry. Uh, doing the cryofixation preserve very well the uh, ultra structure and the uh, fluorescence. So you can do in resin fluorescent uh, protocol. And the most resolutive protocol that uh, we are doing now is the plants, uh, the freezing of the sample and doing all the uh, observation in cryogenic conditions. So uh, you preserve uh, really well the, the structure of the in native condition, the, the sample. So we are doing now some uh, developments in the VIC, the, 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 the CRIO super resolution. Uh, we are trying to be more precise in the localization of the region of interest to be imaged by CRIO electron microscopy. And also uh, they are, uh, we are doing some immunofluorescent labeling after the embedding and section in, in an array of uh, a lot of sections and serial sections. Uh, we this called the, the protocol is called is a ray tomography and uh, we can also do some 3D tomography. And thank you for your attention. Of course, we are open for questions. Is there any questions? There is no, no questions. No uh, I think we were really clear. <laughs> <laughs> I, have a, I have a question about the expansion microscopy. Uh, did you um, um, about the intensity of the labeling when you compare with classical uh, immunofluorescence and after expansion microscopy? Uh, you lose some uh, uh, intensity. So for structures which are small and uh, not easy to immunolabel or to see, do you think that uh, the expansion microscopy will really be a problem or how can we increase the labeling? Because, you know, we, we are working with, uh, with the trypanosome on the small structure. And um, when we try the expansion microscopy, of course, the signal is uh, weaker. Mm -hmm. So do, do you have some ways to increase the, the well, signal? Uh, what I can say, uh, thank you for the question, of course. Um, I know that now there are many protocols and they uh, try to, to, to avoid that uh, for different reasons. Actually, I use the pro expansion microscopy protocol. So it means that they, we do immunolabeling and then you do the expansion. It's true that we lose a lot of the, uh, the signal uh, during the expansion, but what I do is to try to amplify as much as I can the signal. So you, you do, for example, for each GFP protein, I do the immunolabeling of GFP protein. And normally, if you have a sensitive uh, system, you can uh, detect it really well. It's true that we can increase the signal. Now, there are another protocol that you can check, for example, ultra-structural uh, expansion microscopy, which uh, means to, for a small, that is for a small and thinner uh, small samples, like uh, isolated particles or a trypanosome, for example, it would be interesting that you can expand first and do the immunolabeling after. You can come to, to see me and we can check if you like the protocol and we can actually use some uh, antibodies because they published uh, some antibodies that work really well with this approach. And we can try these uh, different uh, protocols, but it's true that uh, you lose a lot of the, the signal. So. Yeah, so because we tried with Nicola, and of course you need to have more concentrated primary antibodies, uh, but then you have more non-specific labeling, so we uh, have... More non-specific labeling? Well, the, the, the background is much higher. The, the less... Before the expansion or after the expansion? 
after the expansion. Okay, so maybe it's to concentrate the, the, the antibody. Yeah. Maybe it's, uh, the concentration is too, because we want to have more signal, we are adding too much uh, maybe antibody. Right. And at the end, we have a background that is uh, really yeah. uh, noisy. It's true that you have a background there sometimes when it's close to the cover slip. Okay, and for the secondary antibody, do you concentrate it also? Or you just concentrate the primary? I just to... uh, concentrate the primary. And then I am you not keep... really, I am not really uh, familiar with this uh, protocol because I am starting with it. But Nicola, for example, is really a good uh, user, and uh, he he loves this protocol and he said that it works really really well. So you can. Uh, okay. 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 Thanks. So we've got a question from the chat. Are you doing much rehash em these days? <laughs> these days. <laughs> Not not here in the platform, but I saw uh, that is the, the possibility of uh, doing it. Uh, the, the thing of this uh, this um, uh, approaches is that uh, the user has to come with the molecular uh, construct with the expression of these uh, uh, constructs in the in their in their tissue. So you have to express uh, tetracysteine, and then you use these uh, molecules, uh, REASH or officials uh, for uh, the reaction. So, but this is possible. It's, it's not a problem to do it because, but this, this is mostly we cannot uh, really develop it if there is not a, a biological question. So we need uh, someone is coming with this uh, this approach. Okay. Thanks. There is, there is a comment which is the REACH system was toxic for live labeling on our parasites. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's true. Uh, we, there are people and they're having some problems with that. But it's uh, uh, normally for like for electron microscopy, you won't have any problem. Normally, you can do it, uh, fix it, uh, you fix it, uh, you to spread the tetracycline. After that, I don't know very well the, the system, but this uh, you have to fix. And then after uh, you can do pre-embedding uh, labeling, of course, for the, it's true that it would be interesting to do it in life imaging and like that you do correlative uh, microscopy. But uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure they are improving this, the, the dice. I was thinking of EM actually, so examples, but I just wanted to know if there was much experience on it before I, I came with my, uh, with my ideas. I don't have any experience. <laughs> Sorry, I cannot tell. Okay, you. well, maybe in the future it can be I developed. Think, uh, Apex two is uh, going really, really strong. I think mm. it's uh, and because you can do Apex two is a peroxidase, and you can do uh, actually a fusion proteins yeah. with that. So you can localize uh, specific proteins in different compartments. So you, you have to uh, to to do a molecular construct with your protein of interest. You would you do fusion with a peroxidase. You express it and then you can see it actually uh, also in fluorescence okay. and then uh, you go to the uh, apex two i think is uh, the better approach but this to my experience i don't know about the the other system i don't know it very well yeah, combine yeah. Use of yeah. also i had a second question if if i well remember what i read the problem with the REACH is that you're using at some point a component that is uh, a derivative of arsenic. So the idea, if you're working on live, uh, on live cells, is to increase a bit the concentration of glucose so that you don't block the mitochondria, if I well remember. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it was, for, it, was for, it was for dead cells anyway, big cells. Um, and the second question was, what, have you used uh, uh, gold particles for, to probe uh, nanobodies on uh, thin sections? Where the nanobodies are the primary antibodies? Yeah. Nano, uh, instead of uh, nanoparticles, you are talking about going to gold uh, particles pre-embedding with gold particles? No, no. I'm talking about... Uh, uh, post embedding uh, labeling where you cut a, a section. Do you have you probe your section with an antibody and then use your your second uh, your your actually uh, electron dense probe as uh, gold? Have you used that? 
And if so, what would the gold be? So the nanobody, use a nanobody for post embedding. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, uh, the, I just used nanobody for one time and it was in pre embedding. Okay. But not sure to understand why you want to do this. <laughs> because it has because we have, well, okay. Uh, it's just that the, the nanobodies can get to, to structures that uh, the classic immunoglobulin G cannot. Um, but then you don't, I'm just wondering, do you have uh, anti-nanobody gold? That's my, that's my, my ah, question. Ah, no. Right, okay. All right, thank you. Okay, if we don't have more questions, so we're going to close this session. Thank you all for your patience at the beginning with the small troubles. Thank you for the question and the discussion. And the uh, take home message is uh, we can do immunolabeling, we can do immunolabeling in light microscopy, we can do immunolabeling in electron microscopy. So come to us, ask your questions, we discuss about the sample, we do some trials, and we will be uh, happy to help you. Yeah. And see you soon for the next uh, episode of our season of workshops. Yeah. Bye. Bye bye.